Hello. My name is Stefano Tijerina, and I, uh, I'm the director for the Peace and Justice Center of Eastern Maine here in Bangor. T as in Tom, I J E R I N A. I'm also a professor of history and political science at the University of Maine, and I also teach in the business school for Hassan University. So, uh, yes, I am. <laughs> uh, and my wife is not happy with me. <laughs> but here I am. Uh, so I'll make it brief, because I have to get home. Um, so a lot of things have been said, uh, but I have a couple more things to add to the, um, to the analysis about the uh, the negatives of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, as a historian, I, I must uh, give it some sort of historical context. So um, this is a story that, uh, the story of globalization and of the expansion of markets beyond the nation state. Uh, this represents sort of like um, another gear in the expansion of globalization through this uh, free trade agreement. So we are going from a, from a market of 12% uh, of the global economy, which is represented by NAFTA, to a 40% global market outreach through this um, trade agreement, which means that there is, there is a linear uh, precedent that shows that over time, since the 20th century, we have been moving away from the sovereignty of the nation state and toward a new sovereignty that is uh, regulated outside of the nation state, which is globalization, <coughs> where the, the main actors of, uh, of the regulatory process and the main actors of the decision-making process are the the private sector interests and not small business, but big corporations and monstrous corporations, which are no longer even owned by uh, their, their own citizens. In other words, an American multinational is not owned by an American, American citizens, but is owned by a multiple uh, series of shareholders that have multiple nationalities that is part of globalization. So Ford is owned by Indian capital, Brazilian capital. Uh, today, uh, Burger King is owned by a Brazilian conglomerate. Tim Hortons is owned by this Brazilian conglomerate. Uh, so capital is owned by other people. So it's no longer even accountable to the nation state. It has no national identity. It has no national interest. It has the interest of the global shareholder base, particularly the majority shareholder base. And so these are things that we need to consider when we begin to think about the effectiveness of this free trade agreement. Um, I've been thinking a lot about its re regional geographical context, and it's called Pacific, which means that where, where does Maine land in, in this equation when Maine is not in the Pacific, Maine is in the Atlantic. Um, Maine has no real benefit out of this trade agreement. Uh, and this is important to analyze because as it was mentioned previously, and as it has been mentioned by some of you, uh, previously, before, when we were a nation state that was working for the construction of our own national goodwill and our own citizens, um, the, the paper mills, the shoe factories, the apparel industries that made up the New England economy and provided jobs and communities which developed around this, these industries, slowly began to die as the competition with, within ourselves began, began to tear us apart. So the first step for our companies to move out of New England and out of Maine was to go to the South because it was an unregulated system in the South, because there was cheap labor, because there was less, less labor regulations, because environmental standards were ignored, and those were a good opportunities for businesses to move operations overseas. And when they moved overseas, no, within our territory to a different geography. And, uh, and the consideration of abandoning communities did not really play a big role because uh, at the end the decision is about uh, profit revenues and about uh, shareholder interests. Another uh, interest that 
are not relevant to our community base. This is what you explained happened in the 70s, in the 80s, so on and so forth. With NAFTA, the ability to take that same equation outside of the nation state became possible with free trade agreements. And so you could move operations no longer within our competitive realm, so move the operations from the south, from the north east to, east to the south, or from the south to the west, but now we could move them overseas, and that allowed corporations to have a little bit more flexibility. NAFTA allowed some sort of dynamic, however, we were lucky that under NAFTA, at least, we had some sort of dynamic with a, with a neighboring country that we have constructed some sort of uh, brotherly relationship, with, which is the Canadian economy. But now, we're taking this to another level where there is no brotherly relationship with another economy. We're taking, to, we're taking it to a very different world where the, the 12 other partners of this, uh, of this um, gigantic 40% of the world market has no relevance, historical, cultural, or even political with, with our, with our uh, understandings of uh, democracy and social justice and, and procedures of, of making decisions and so on and so forth. We're going to a very different experiment. And that's what I, what I, what I want you uh, to understand, that this is something that has not even been uh, intellectually uh, recent, what it is to open ourselves to a Japanese economy, what it is to open ourselves to an Australian economy. We are no longer competing with Canada or Mexico where at least we had leverage because we were powerful tenfold to a Mexican economy or even to a Canadian economy. Here we're going to compete against other actors that are going to be aggressively interested in capitalizing on our own internal market. And again, so, so where, are, where are our protective measures? We are actually giving away our protective measures to markets that are, have been waiting patiently for centuries to enter this economy and compete freely with our products. Products that are, have already been weakened because we have loosened our nationalist uh, policies and our uh, own regional policies uh, to protect our own small economies, in this case, the state of Maine. So we're loosening ourselves even more. We're deregulating ourselves even more. Not because we want to, but it's because the global players that I mentioned before, the corporations, are interested that, that this takes place, that this is set up. The reason why it's negotiated behind closed doors is clearly that, because if it was negotiated in front of our faces in a democratic process, then there would be a lot of questions to ask. But if it's, uh, if it's negotiated behind closed doors and thrown to the public 95 days before it's negotiated and, and our president si sense circulates a small op-ed saying that this is a race to the top without explaining why. No, I still don't understand why. I don't think anybody here understands why this is a race to the top. To me, this is a race to the bottom, uh, to a very deep bottom. Um, I. I have spoken to my, my neighbors, I have spoken to my community, and this is in the case of Maine, our home, this is a race to the bottom that has been taking place for most of the 20th century and into the 21st century. So we are, we are used to this race to the bottom. But where is it gonna stop? I don't know. Uh, is this going to create, is this, going to, is this trade agreement gonna motivate our, our young generations to stay in the state? I think they're gonna move to the Pacific where there's Pacific Coast, where there is going to be more jobs, more opportunities. If you think about it historically, all the wealth of, of the nation has moved from New England and, uh, and the Atlantic Coast, which is a decadent region of the United States and has moved to the Pacific region. NAFTA created a lot of wealth for Texas. It did not create a lot of wealth for a collective nation state. So these trade agreements break the nation state. This Trade agreements do not unite the nation states. Puts us into a fight between one another, puts us into a competitive fight as people seeking for work here and there, seeking for opportunities to survive in a more uncertain economy and in a more uncertain political world because uh, our democratic 
abilities to interfere or at least uh, affect the outcomes of policies becomes weaker when we authorize para-state authorities to design our economic future in the long run. And, and that's all I have to say.